The United States has had dozens of presidential elections since the 1796 contest that produced John Adams as the winner. One question that often isn't asked is, what happens to those leaders who capture their party's nomination for the presidency, but never reach the Oval Office? What do you go off and do after you lose one of the most visible public contests in the world? Moreover, what would have happened if some of these presidential losers would have won their election? Now, with some elections, it's hard to argue there would have been much difference. If Rutherford B. Hayes had lost in 1876 to Samuel J. Tilden, there's a good argument to be made that not much would have been different because at this time period, presidents weren't expected to do much more than keep the United States out of foreign wars, keep a somewhat balanced budget, and maintain its revenue. And without a federal income tax, there wasn't a lot of revenue to collect. Other election changes, though, would have been far more consequential. If Abraham Lincoln had lost to Stephen Douglas in 1860, then a pro-slavery Democrat would have led the United States going into the Civil War, and he wouldn't have pushed for emancipation. So things would have turned out very differently. Or if Richard Nixon had been victorious in 1960 against John F. Kennedy, what would Nixon have challenged the United States to reach the moon by the end of the decade? What would have happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Bay of Pigs invasion when some military advisors in our timeline were suggesting the use of nuclear weapons? Would Nixon have agreed? To talk about these what-ifs and what actually happened with those who lost presidential campaigns is today's guest, Peter Shea. He's the author of the new book, In the Arena, A History of American Presidential Hopefuls. So we explore many different what-ifs here, and we also look at how losing can shape one's character. When Theodore Roosevelt lost in 1912 in a campaign against William Howard Taft, representing the Bold Moose Party, Roosevelt gave ultimate credit, quote, to the man who is actually in the arena, who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So we'll look at those people who may have lost, but for the most part did so with dignity. Hope you enjoyed this discussion with Peter Shea. You looked at 34 American leaders who captured their party's nomination, but didn't reach the Oval Office. I wonder, could you see any common thread of these losing campaigns? Or is it like the Anna Karenina principle, where Tolstoy says that all happy families look similar, but unhappy families are miserable each in their own way. Are winning campaigns similar and losing campaigns have defects in their own way? Or was there a common thread that you could see? I love the Anna Karenina comparison. I would have to go with the idea that they're all unique in their own way. The quote that I always come to that comes to mind when I think about the these elections is when Napoleon asked what quality looks forward to in generals, he said luck. Timing and luck and so many variables that no one has any control over can impact the way an election goes. And they certainly did in many of these cases. So I know I love doing the postmortems on, you know, why someone lost. And I'm particularly interested in how people handle the loss and how they moved on in life after that kind of significant loss. So I would say they're unique in their own way. I also think that how we as a country respond to a person whose loss is very significant as well. Right. There's a lot to unpack here because the political afterlives of these people take very different directions, and it speaks a lot to their character of how they uh, pick up and move on afterwards. As we get into this, we'll look at a lot of counterfactuals and what if this person or that person had won. But first of all, I'd like to look at some of the early losers of presidential elections because the way elections were ran were very different in the 19th century than they are today. Could you tell me about some of the early presidential failures like an Aaron Burr or Henry Clay or others? Yeah, as you pointed out, the system, we were still evolving. And I think for the first 70 years of our government, it was still going through some major shifts and changes. In some respects, we were still experimenting at the very beginning. With Aaron Burr again, he became vice president simply because he came in second. Obviously, that's not how we do things today. As we developed a more party-oriented political culture, there was a greater degree of control over who arrived at the uh, the top seats. But the interesting thing about Burr is that I think at a later time, he could have won. He had the political instincts that would have suited him well in more modern campaigns. He had personal charm. He understood the role of parties. He was one of the key founders of the Tammany Hall um, political machine in New York. So ironically, he was someone who, who, who probably ran for president too early in the century. But later on, I think he would have been more capable and, and that, that was at a time when there was still a lot of power in the hands of individual personalities. And I, and I think if you rubbed certain people wrong, they could really block it, as in the case with Burr and Jefferson. But it's, it's a, yeah, it's a fascinating figure. And again, for all the things that we remember him for, 
may not have been a bad president. He was a very smart man, very gifted, very forward thinking in a number of ways, certainly cynical, opportunistic, but then we've had presidents like that before. So it's, you know, we remember him because of that one event with Alexander Hamilton. But then we have to remember too that duels were not uncommon at the time. Several of our prominent politicians had duels and went on and survived. And that Hamilton's own son died in a duel. So we tend to see him through a modern prism. But again, I, it's probably better to see him through the prism of his contemporaries. Could you uh, list off some of the reasons why presidential candidates lost in the 19th century? Because we noted that the system was very different, but right. also the method of running for office was very different. It's not until I think William Jennings Bryant in 1896, where someone is personally doing whistle stop tours and personally rallying the public. A lot of times you would just dispatch lieutenants or often, more often than not hatchet men to take out your opponent. So in that case, when the nature of running for office is very different and campaigning is very different, you're not, your image isn't plastered all over commercials. You're not personally leading rallies. What are some things that would make somebody lose back then? Well, one thing was if you were too strongly associated with a particular region of the country, and therefore were perceived as not being sympathetic to the interests of another portion of the country. You know, the early United States, again, was, was a multiplicity of highly independent states. And it's only after the Civil War that we say the United States is. Before the Civil War, we say the United States are. And that was true in a very real sense. So you had more of a confederation of regions and states. And ironically, if you were an unusually good regional leader with a lot of ability and you really understood the, the interests of your region and represented it well, that could go against you in a national election. I think that was certainly the case with individuals like Henry Clay or John C. Calhoun or Daniel Webster. They were the three political giants of their era and they all aspired to the presidency. Unfortunately, they were seen too much as men of their region. So consequently, the presidency often went to compromise candidates who are not distinguished by being associated with the region. For those who ran for office at this time period, when they lost, what did they go on and do afterwards? And we can look at both distinguished examples and undistinguished examples. Well, the distinguished examples usually were people serving on high levels of politics, either in the cabinet level or in um, the Senate or the House of Representatives. So often, if you were a senator or a representative and you lost, you simply continued on your political career uninterrupted. There was no sense that Having run for president, you could no longer uh, condescend to do something else. I mean, that was a period when you even had an ex-president, John Quincy Adams, run for and then serve in the House of Representatives. So there was no sense that you had to leave office. In a very real sense, it was more like the parliamentary system in England, where a person could serve as prime minister, then lose the office of prime minister, and then still continue to serve in parliament. So we had a more parliamentarian mindset, I would think, uh, at that time. Obviously, it's different now. Right. It seems now when there are follow-up interviews with people who lose presidential campaigns, when they talk about the early days after the campaign is over, they give their concession speech, they go off, they act as if their entire family died in a plane crash. They're wandering through the woods by themselves. They really go into a wilderness period, but it doesn't seem like it's like that in the 19th century. They just, it's sort of like they applied for a job, they didn't get it, and they keep going about their affairs. Is that accurate, you'd say? Yes, I would say that's very accurate. Again, they're, they're living in a very different media environment than we are. You know, they can still uh, show up in public. You know, they, like you said before, they're not campaigning for themselves individually. Other people are doing it for them. They're simply waiting to hear about the results and they'll be disappointed. But, you know, life goes on. Again, you know, it's, I think it's very different when your face has been plastered everywhere and you've exhausted yourself and your family during an arduous campaign only to lose. That's a different psychological experience than what was experienced in, in the early 19th century. There was disappointment to be certain. It was a concession speech. But then on Monday, life began again. And I think in many ways, it's, it was a healthier political culture for people who were contending for top office. Right. And a campaign in the 19th century, it would be, what, a few months long? Whereas today, it's your people now for 2024 are already starting to put out feelers and put together campaign networks. And then it really begins in earnest. There are announcements for a campaign, something like 18 months before an election happens. So it's as long as a war. So the term campaign is very accurate with how politics is done today. Yes, it is. And I, again, I think that's a dysfunction of our current political culture. 18 months is too much time and energy being wasted on the next person for the job rather than focusing on what's in front of you. I think we really should have a, a method where we're doing it for like limited to three or four months tops. 
So the idea that you're campaigning shortly after the previous candidate has won is just, that's too much energy into campaigning. And quite frankly, I think most people will have made up their minds anyway. So it's a waste of effort. The energy could be used in better ways. And obviously, as you pointed out, it's very psychologically draining for the people involved. Well, let's get into the individuals in your book and also the counterfactuals. Among the people that you profiled who lost, who are those that had they won, do you think would have had the biggest effect on history and why would that be? So you can start anywhere you want to at any time, but let's start, let's unpack this. Well, I think that the first person who leaps to mind obviously would be Stephen Douglas. If Stephen Douglas had won instead of Lincoln, he'd be living in a very different country. I think Douglas was a man of great ability. He, he, he wasn't great, but he had elements of greatness in him, I would say. But he wasn't someone who could necessarily, he could have prosecuted the war. But again, as a pro-slavery Democrat, I don't think there would have been an amendment abolishing slavery. I think he would have gone with those conservatives who wanted to reestablish the country as much as it had been before the war. So I think Douglas probably wins the prize for the most significant candidate who could have won in terms of the outcome for the country. I think there are very few instances where an alternative candidate would have made that big of a difference. Um, so that's the top of the ranking there. Who else? You know, it's hard to say. One of the things about our process of picking presidents is that, say what you will, most of these men are products of the same political culture in many ways, that there's more similarities than differences. So I'm not certain how much difference there would have been in terms of uh, general policies. I think we would have been spared a few conspicuously incompetent presidents. I think, for example, if Charles Evan Hughes had won over Woodrow Wilson, we would have been spared the embarrassment of the Harding administration. That's one thing. I think Thomas Dewey would have made a perfectly good president. In terms of radical differences, I struggle to find one that really, you know, if, if McGovern had won in 72, the Vietnam War might have won, um, run down a little earlier, but I, the, the longer outcome wouldn't have been a difference. So I would have to say that, um, I would say the Douglas Lincoln campaign of 1860 was the most consequential in terms of how history might have gone differently. But I think, you know, I think larger forces often shape what happens in the country more so than the decisions of individual presidents. But that's one case where I think that would be the exception. That gets to a question of how much control a president has on the economy, foreign policy, other factors. Usually, if things are going poorly for a president, the supporters will say, well, a president can't really do all that much. And if things are going very well, they'll talk about the powers of the executive office. So that's an interesting question of how much effect they can have. Following up on what you said there, because these are people from the same class, there might not be a radical difference from one person or another. Could you uh, maybe identify the least consequential uh, election? Um, and I'm thinking in particular, way back in the days of 2000, this was after the Cold War, but before 9-11, when Western society was in this period of ennui, this restless boredom. Yeah. One of the complaints about the election between George W. Bush and Al Gore was that they were too similar. Rage Against the Machine had a music video called Testify, where there were clips from the two of them spliced where they were saying basically the same things. And it was a huge uh, promo video for Ralph Nader. In an episode of Futurama, there were two clones named Jack Johnson and John Jackson who were running against each other and had literally the same platform. So this was a complaint way back when. Simpler times. But can you think, is there an election that stands out to you where it seemed to make almost no difference whatsoever who won because the two were so similar? You know... Probably in the 19th century, late 19th century, there were a lot of elections where it didn't really matter if Tweedledee or Tweedledum won. The post-Civil War period was particularly a period when it was really the party was in control. And both parties, both the Republicans and the Democrats, chose good party men who did what they were told. No matter what differences appear in a platform, the bottom line is don't wreck the economy, don't get us into unnecessary wars, and otherwise, you know, leave us alone. I think during times of prosperity, it's, there's, a, there's a preference for laissez-faire presidents. You don't want anyone to rock the boat. So in terms of, of elections, I would say the election between uh, Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes, where Tilden won the, the popular vote and there was a contention and there was a compromise of 1876. You know, I don't, whether, would there have been difference? I don't really think so. I don't really think so. I think the only significant thing about that election was not what the presidents did, but what the parties agreed to do. 
which was in the case of one party saying, we, we won't contest the election, even though we can, but in exchange, you have to demilitarize the South and pull back troops so we can go on, we can end reconstruction. So in that sense, that was significant. But in terms of the temperament of the men and the decisions they would have made, I, I don't see much, much difference. And, and I think that was very much true of the, I think the late 19th century was a really period where you had these essentially colorless men where you had the Jack Johnson and John Jackson types. <laughs> That's true. I mean, and with the powers of the executive office being less than they are today, there's not as much as they could done. Something that is a charge that's thrown against presidential candidates when they're doing poorly is that they're intentionally trying to throw the election. And this sounds similar to sports, where if a team is doing so poorly, you wonder if there's some insider betting going on. Now, I, I don't know of any particular cases of a major candidate who would intentionally throw election. However, a figure that I come back to because I'm really fascinated by his life for good and for bad is Curtis LeMay, the Army Air Force general and vice presidential candidate of George Wallace and his running mate in 1968. LeMay didn't want Wallace to win, but he wanted to spoil the election for Hubert Humphrey because he thought Richard Nixon would defend America better from Soviet aggression. So he ran as a spoiler and by linking himself to Wallace, detonated his reputation, uh, but he didn't really care. So are you aware of cases where either it's well documented or at least highly speculated where somebody was trying to be a spoiler and intentionally throwing the election? Well, let me first start by saying I, too, am fascinated by Curtis LeMay. And I, I recently enjoyed Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Bomber Mafia, which t talks about LeMay's um, influence on Air Force culture in particular. So, yeah, I, a fascinating figure, LeMay. I don't know of any presidential candidate who is deliberately trying to run the black. The only thing I could come close to would be Horace Greeley. I don't think really particularly wanted to be president, but I do think, I do think he was trying to keep Ulysses Grant from being president again because he didn't think Grant did a good enough job. And he felt there was a need to be a disruptor because at that time, in the post Civil War decades, at least for the first 20 years, we really were a one party state. Um, the Democrats had been so, their reputation had been tarnished by having so many of their prominent members join the Confederacy. And the Republicans were the, the, the party of victory. We really weren't having, you know, elections in the fullest sense of the word. And I think really introduced a very interesting thing into the politics, which is the idea that you could challenge a candidate from your own party, which was something that, you know, is unusual and which obviously would replicated, you know, many years later by Teddy Roosevelt when he challenged Taft to the Republican nomination, even though Taft was a sitting president. So I think the only one who could have said to be trying, not a spoiler, but a disruptor, I would go with Greeley. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't follow up on Teddy Roosevelt, because I try to talk about his life as much as possible. And he inspired the name of your book, so that's only fair. Could you tell me about his failure in his election, why he failed, and his speech as well? It's just such a great speech and great lines in it, too. You know, the quote from the speech in the arena has been, has been quoted so many times, but nobody remembers the name of the speech. Do you, remember, do you know the name of the speech? I'm going to test you here. Scott here. We're going to have a very short word from our sponsors. But first, I want to give a shout out to all the great shows on the Parthenon Podcast Network, including History of the Papacy. You can find this and many other great shows at ParthenonPodcast.com. Uh, things are coming to my mind. I mean, my brain is saying strenuous life, but I'd say, no, that's not right. Um, I'm, I'm failing the Teddy Roosevelt quiz. Ugh. That's shame. No disgrace there. No disgrace. Virtually no one. It's, it's, it's like asking people, name all the actors who were played the Corleone brothers in The Godfather. Everyone can name, you know, um, the first two, but they can't remember the guy who played Fredo. So that's no, there's no disgrace there. <laughs> yeah, it's citizen in, a, uh, citizen in a republic, citizenship in a republic. And the general theme of the speech is that republics, being a different form of government from other times, require citizens who take risks and put themselves out. They need to take risks and, and be engaged, and they have to be in the arena. A republic cannot afford passive citizenry, and therefore it's absolutely important to go out and try, even at the risk of great failure. And I just think that's such a, a vital message, and uh, I, that's, why the, that's part of the greatness of the speech, is that he says, you know what? Republics don't take care of themselves. You have to have people who take risks, 
even if it means a loss of reputation or or defeat. And I think it goes to the heart of what the book is about in terms of honoring these people who lost because they put themselves in a place of consist- uh, conspicuous risk that many of us would not have. And I think that's a quality that we should admire. And certainly it was a quality that Roosevelt would have admired. What do you think would have happened if Teddy Roosevelt would have won in 1912? I think there's a whole book about this topic by, it could be Harry Turtledove, one of those alternate history authors. But what's your take on if he would have won? I think we would have been involved in World War I much sooner. I don't think he would have kept us out of war. I think he would have gone full throttle into war because he felt, and I think it's one of the things that distinguished him from Wilson, where Wilson was more calculating about the, the pros and the cons of America being in the war. But for Roosevelt, not participating in a civilizational struggle was a disgrace. And I think he would have found ways to, to provoke us into war. And of course, that would have had its own repercussions. After the war, people would have thought, we can't involve another Roosevelt. They're so warlike. But um, I definitely think that's one of the things that would have been different from Roosevelt. And, you know, I, I think he would have been a good president. Although I think that by 1916 and by 1918, the world that he thrived in is changing too much. And in many ways, he was becoming yesterday's man. He was, a, I think, a great president. But he was a man of a moment. And I think the greatest mistake he ever made was not running in 1908, you know, and, and not, I mean, that was, I, I think he thought it was a mistake as well. But again, it's there's great what ifs, you know, but he was a remarkable figure, remarkable figure, obviously one who captivates a lot of people interested in history. Well, just to follow up, because it's fun to speculate on these things, Roosevelt at the helm in World War I, my initial thoughts were that on the one hand, it would be terrible because America would be involved in the most hellish parts of the war, the Battle of Verdun, and we didn't really show up till the end. So we missed out on the horrifying levels of death that France and Germany and Britain experienced and other nations too. On the other side too, I think he would have been a much better diplomat than Wilson. He wouldn't have messed up the peace as a experienced negotiator between the Russo-Japanese War. Things could have perhaps turned out better or not. I don't know. That was just my knee-jerk speculation. But what are your thoughts since you've contemplated this more? I think he would have certainly taken a less academic approach to negotiation and diplomacy than Wilson. I think his previous experience and his own understanding of a warlike nature uh, might have led to a better peace than the one that, that Wilson engaged in. Certainly, he was healthier at the time. I mean, Wilson's health obviously was beginning to decline, and that impacted a number of things, including the, the, the process of the Treaty of Versailles in the United States, whereas Roosevelt, though obviously he had serious health issues, was fairly vigorous up until the very end. So I think the health issue would have certainly been a benefit to him. And I think he would have done a good job. I don't think he would have made major errors, but it would have been fascinating to see um, a Roosevelt, you know, 2.0. And I'm, I'm curious to, and I'd be curious to see how that would have impacted the presidential ambitions of Franklin Roosevelt a decade or so later. So, you know, it's, it's again, very different personalities, very different personalities. Would have been fascinating if, if Wilson would have agreed to let Roosevelt serve in the war, which I believe um, Roosevelt requested, but, you know. Looking at 20th century presidents, are there others that you think would have really changed history? Because this is when the office of the presidency becomes much more powerful. There's all sorts of fiction that's interested in these sorts of what ifs, where if Kennedy hadn't been president, then America would have lost the space race. Or if Kennedy had uh, not been assassinated, his Addison's disease would have taken over, or perhaps his affairs would have come to light, and he would have not been remembered as fondly in history. There's also a lot of fiction that, for whatever reason, is interested in Nixon, not just remaining president, but taking on multiple terms. So Watchmen, the Alan Moore graphic novel, has Nixon being president forever. In Back to the Future 2, the alternate history where Biff Tannen gets the sports almanac and becomes a billionaire, I think, Somewhere there's background details where Nixon is president forever. So all the dystopian sci-fi elements, for whatever reason, have Nixon be president for 12 or 16 years. I don't know why this is such a common trope. But are there any other really consequential changes that you see in the 20th century as the office of president becomes much more powerful? Yeah, and I've read Harriet Chertoff's novels as well, and I'm fascinated by alternate history. I think it's an essential, thinking about what if is an essential way of understanding history. I think the removal of Henry Wallace from the presidential ticket in 44 was an extremely consequential decision. I think it was the right decision. I think Wallace was, again, another gifted man, but dangerously naive 
in certain ways. And the decisions he made as a post-war president could have had radical implications for the security of the West. I think something which he conceded in the last years of his life, that he was wrong about certain things. I think the choice of Harry Truman, which obviously struck people at the time as, as kind of odd, turned out to be the absolutely right choice for the time, because we needed a person of hard, good sense more than any other quality. So I think the I think the election of 44 was a particularly crucial one, and not only because the, the voting of Roosevelt in again um, finally exasperated people enough to say, okay, we have to actually impose term limits. We can't simply make it a custom because obviously this guy has blown through the whole custom thing. I think term limits for president are a very good idea. With regards to Nixon, I think Nixon could have been a very good president if he'd been elected in, in 1960. I also think that if Kennedy had lived, we would probably have not have seen a Civil Rights Act. I don't think he was very good at passing legislation. I think his reputation is largely based upon a few years in the presidency where he represented through his personality the vitality of a young, powerful country and articulated its values. But I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have been as, as consequential as people like to imagine him to have been. I think he was a more of a figure of inspiration. I think someone like Nixon had more political acumen than Kennedy did. But Nixon, unfortunately, a tragic figure, was, is brought down by his own personal flaws. So as, as is the case of Lyndon Johnson, again, another towering figure, tremendous ability, but also tremendous limitations. So we have these epic figures. That's one of the things that's interesting about, you know, there hasn't been anyone really in the past few decades in the presidency that I think of as being really having that kind of Shakespearean quality. They've all been good. I think for the most part, they've been good public servants, but they, you don't, you can't see anyone writing an extended biography of them because they just, there's something that's, there's a quality that's missing. And I, I don't know why that is. I think some of the passages that through which people go through in earlier generations, some of the, the way has been smoothed and that's made it easier to, I mean, it's made it harder to, for the sort of character development we often need in a president. One of the most fascinating speculations I've ever seen about a presidential candidate was one about um, Adley Stevenson. And it was the writer Gary Wills who said that, while Stevenson superficially mirrored Franklin and Roosevelt, there was a crucial difference between them that wasn't fully appreciated at the time, which was that Roosevelt became a, a very different person as a consequence of polio and the struggle therein. It was really the crucible in which he emerged as the man he would become. Before that, he was a very talented dilettante. And Stevenson always remained a very talented dilettante throughout his political career. He never really grew. He never really had that trial by fire, which would have, might have made him a better man and a better leader. So I think it's an example, a particularly interesting one, since given how much support Stevenson had from 1952 through 1960 in his party to become president. So I think that's, that's a great example of someone who would have disappointed people because of that missing element in his, in his character. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Michael Dukakis wrote the foreword of your book, who lost the 1988 presidential campaign. He's been cited by some as a person who took losing well and used it as a chance to improve himself and fuel a future of public service, even though he wasn't doing what he hoped that he would be doing as U.S. president. Can you talk about him and others who you think took a loss and channeled that well? Yeah, in the case of Dukakis, this is not well known, but early in his career, Dukakis had a devastating political setback, which really had a profound effect on him. He had been elected governor of Massachusetts, and he had done a good job. The state was fiscally sound, it, you know, it was well run, and he thought he was going to coast to a second term, particularly given how superficial his opponent was. So when he lost to his opponent, he was devastated. He couldn't understand why he didn't win, because he didn't really reconcile, he didn't really recognize his own limitations. He wasn't good necessarily at, at connecting with people. He was a very gifted technocrat. But in politics, you really need to reach out and connect with people, or else they might not necessarily vote you back into office. There's a great illustration of this point by the Boston politician, House Representatives leader Tip O'Neill, who um, early in his career heard from his lifelong neighbor that she hadn't decided yet who she was going to vote for a representative. And he said to her, but ma'am, I've been, when I was a kid, I used to cut your lawns. And she said, I know, Thomas, 
but you haven't asked me for my vote. And people like to be asked. And so thereafter, O'Neill learned the lesson. And he was always, no matter how strong his reputation, he always made a point of going out and campaigning hard. And on the morning of every election, he would turn to his wife and say, dear, I would like your vote. And she would say, Thomas, I will give it every consideration. <laughs> and that's, again, so psychologically, Dukakis went through a very tough two years where he retreated into academia, lived the life of a college professor, and then came back. And it was his second term as governor that was even more successful than his first one. But having run and lost early on in his life in a role that really was important to him, I think prepared him for the loss of the presidency. What was his political or professional afterlife after the loss, just out of curiosity? He returned to academia. He became a professor of public policy at Northeastern, which he technically still is. He's been there. He's taught at Northeastern in the fall, and he teaches at UCLA in the spring, in the winter and the spring, or at least he has up until recently. He's now quite old. He's in his mid-80s. So I don't know whether or not he's still actively doing that, but that's what he was doing in decades. And of course, he remained active as a party elder and advisor. And I had a great opportunity. My co-creator of the book, Tom Eddy, and I had a great chance to talk with um, the governor, and he was quite candid about the political life. And it was, it was tremendous fun talking with him and really speaking to someone who knew what it's like. And that really was a, added a special quality to our experience creating the book. There's an interesting point of your book that you touch on, and that has to do with national memory. And even though these people, of course, aren't remembered as well as the winners of presidential election, something you touch on is the statue debate and statues of these various figures that exist because they might be famous for different reasons. Why do you think the conversation surrounding the removal of national statues, something in the last few years, discussions of, do we remove these statues of Confederate figures? Do we remove these other statues who had a much more checkered past and we've been willing to let on? Why do you think this conversation of the removal of statues and monuments, it's only being taken seriously now in light of the discussion in your book? Well, you know, when we began the book, it was as much about the monuments to these people as it was the people themselves. Because we joked that if you're going to write about a book about monuments to fail presidential candidates, you have the benefit that no one's going to be competing with you. <laughs> and we were curious about public memory in America, which is different than it is in other parts of the world. When you travel to Europe, you see statues everywhere, everywhere. Remembering the past is very important. Where in America, we have a, a sort of ambivalent attitude towards the past. And certainly when we began writing the book, people weren't paying much attention to statues. But then obviously things changed in our culture. And, you know, statues and monuments became discussed on social media and their implications. And what do they represent our current values? Which is a healthy conversation. I think in some cases, it got a little carried away, but it's, I'm glad that the people are realizing that monuments matter because they represent our, not only what's happened, but our values. Because who we choose to represent and who we choose not to represent says a lot about who we are as a people. So I think, for example, when the, when Calhoun Co College at Yale was renamed, I think that made perfect sense. I think while Calhoun had contributed largely positively to the America, in the first decades of his career, his emphasis on segregation and slavery diminished his impact. And his role as, since the intellectual father of Southern succession, obviously had did tremendous damage. So ignoring that fact, I don't think was healthy. I and mean, we had, we'd done it for a long time because we wanted to kind of balance between the North and the South. Again, it was part of the post Civil War reconciliation. I believe the Calhoun College had been named in the 1920s around the time that the Lincoln Memorial was being launched. So it was kind of a counterbalancing between honoring Northern history and Southern history. And now we realize we shouldn't be doing that. The South lost for a very good reason. And we should stop pretending that it was simply um, some sort of gentleman's disagreement. And I think the removal of Calhoun's name made sense. So I, and I'm glad people are paying attention to monuments. So, you know, and I, I'm fascinated by the way in which people are remembered, not just through statues, but through buildings and so on and so forth. Some monuments are more effective than others. I mean, Fremont, for example, has more things named after him than virtually any American, and yet almost nobody remembers him. So it's a hit and miss process. I'm curious to tie in these different figures together. Even though many of them aren't remembered, what would you say, if you could summarize it, the impact is of presidential candidates who lost? It could be an impact that is unknown to most people, but what would you say is their impact and are there lessons that can be taken 
from those who are able to move on and change their careers or learn from the loss and keep going forward. I always think about the beer that Al Gore grew after the election of, of 2000. <laughs> Remember that? Yes, that was the when I was thinking of the wilderness years where people go off and yeah. find themselves. I imagine him and his flannel and all that. I, I think he literally went to the wilderness. Like, what am I going to do now? Because Gore was uh, someone who had literally been raised by his father to become president. I mean, it was, it was the whole resume building was. And at another time, he might have. But uh, I think Gore is a good example of someone who was too polished. I mean, there was. You didn't, you know, you saw Al Gore, you kind of liked him, but you didn't feel passionate about him because he was always trying to please people. And, 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 you know, so I think winning candidates need to have a little roughness and a little quality to them that, that has not been polished and come across as, as authentic to people. Um, I, I think it's very important. But I, I do think that if people, I, I think this is what we can take away from it, is the idea that trying greatly and even failing is important, even if you fail. It's better than not trying. It's better than not trying. And in a country like ours, we need our best people to try to become political leaders because the absence of political talent can be devastating. It can be devastating. And I, I don't envy anyone who runs for president. I don't envy anyone who wins or loses for president. But I think we, we have to say, you have to try. Even in these strange and difficult times, you have to try. Absolutely. And Roosevelt nailed it when he said that if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So we can respect that effort better than not to even try in the beginning. Well, there are many more stories in your book. And for listeners who want to check it out, the name of it is In the Arena, A History of American Presidential Hopefuls. Peter, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And it can be found on Amazon and at trope.com. Our publishers are Trope Publishing. So if you want to find it on the publishing site, it's trop.com. Thanks, Scott. All right. That is it for today. If you would like to see show notes for this episode, along with all my others, go to parthenonpodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network that I'm a part of, along with James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other great history shows as well. If you'd like to support History Unplugged, the two easiest ways to do so are to subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second way is to join our membership program. And if you do so, you'll get completely ad-free episodes of the entire back catalog, which is 600 episodes and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash unplugged. 